leaders say clap, clap, the leaders say sway, you sway, but you get to a point beyond the veil where your worship is for real. Kansas is going to come and Bishop Gordon is going to jump in here a little bit. We're going to leave here tonight worshiping the Lord. How many know if he never does anything else, he's already done worthy of all the worship because of who he is. Come on, clap your hands, everybody.
Good morning and welcome to the church at EPFM. That's right, East Point First Malalu United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you could worship with us today. Today we are celebrating Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You know, a lot of people have suffered through this disease and a lot of people have died from it. So today we just want to thank and honor all those who have survived and remember those who have passed because of this disease. You know, God is good all the time and all the time God is truly good. As I said, welcome to EPFM. We're glad that you could be here with us worshiping today. Don't you love our sanctuary? Isn't this a beautiful place? When we come back in, we would love to have you to come join with us. We're glad that you're here. Why don't you just push that share button at the bottom hand corner and let other people see what you're watching today. Start a watch party. We want to share this good news. Now, we have a few things coming up. November, we're celebrating our anniversary all month long. November 24th, 2002, the merger of East Point First and Malalu United Methodist Churches came together as one body of believers. Both churches over a century old now worshiping together for the last 18 years. So we will be celebrating the entire month of November. If you would like, we would love to have you give us a two minute video of your experience either with the merger or what this church means to you that we can run once uh, every Sunday uh, in November to let people know how good God is right here at East Point First Malalu. Now, we want to offer you the opportunity to share in this ministry. We already talked about sharing the video. You can also like the video, but you can share in this ministry by giving of your gifts. And members, you know that means your tithes and your offerings. But you don't have to be a member here to give. Anyone can give. We have five ways that you can give. You can go to our website at epfmumc.org. That's epfmumc.org. You can give there. You can give through the Give Plus app. You can also text the amount that you want to give to 404-567-5052. That's 404-567-5052. You can mail a check to the church. Don't mail cash. Mail a check to the church. You can mail a money order at 2651. That's 2651 Church Street, East Point, Georgia, 30344, or you can drive by and drop it into our mail slot. Our mail slot is a lockbox, so you can put cash into the mail slot. Now, won't you pray with me for this offering that God has blessed us with? Oh, Lord our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your presence in this space. We thank you for your bounty, oh Lord, because you are a God who never stops giving. Now, Lord, we want to just give back a part of what you have given to us. We want to give back to you. So, Lord, we ask that you multiply these gifts 30, 60, 100 fold, that you may be glorified in this kingdom. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus that we do pray and ask it all. Let us all say amen. Today, we are blessed to have uh, a good friend, Reverend Andre Patterson, who will read our scripture and will also lead us to God in prayer. your bodies as living 
sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God will with a good pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I can say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, who are many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is the word of God for the people of God. And the people of God say, Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to join me in prayer. Dear Lord God, we come to your heavenly throne at this season, at this new mercy, God, to lift up our Almighty God. Oh, Lord, we just praise and worship you right now in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, because you are a God who loves his children. You are a God of all creation. You are our God. And, Lord, we thank you for being our God. Lord, I lift up right now this nation to you, God. I pray, Lord, that those in charge, those in leadership of this nation, Lord, would be brought under your submission, dear God. Because we know, Lord, that your word says that the government is on the shoulders of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, let your will be done, regardless of who is chosen, who is selected in the debate, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would come over them, Lord, like it did in the beginning, hovering over the earth, Lord, bringing all chaos under its submission. Then, Lord, I'd like to pray also for the people of this land. Oh, Lord, you said that we would turn from our wicked ways, dear God that you would heal our land. Oh, Lord, let your spirit continue to be poured out in your people this morning, God, that you would come, Lord, and heal our land. You would hear the prayers of your people, Lord, and be moved on our behalf by the power of your son, Jesus Christ. Then, Lord, also I'd like to lift up East Point First Bible Church and the members thereof, Lord. I'd also like to lift up, Lord, the angel of this house. Lord, guide him and continue to lead him, even on today as he brings a mighty word from your word. Oh, Lord, let your children, who are the parishioners of EPFM, Lord, be led by your word, dear God. Let them be lifted in their spirits, God, and that their word, that the word of your holiness will go into their bones and change them from the inside out as they work with their backs, as EPFM moves into this new generation. pandemic of COVID, permeates through the pandemic of racism, permeates through the pandemic of, of, of sexism, permeates through the pandemic of hatred, Lord, in this country, that your glory, God, will shine forth. Lord, as I bring this prayer to a close, I just pray that your Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in this service, rest, rule, and abide in the hearts of the people of EPFM, and rest, rule, and abide over this land, over the United States of America.
Amen. Amen. Praise is what I do. Isn't that what God calls us to do? We are made in God's image and we are called to praise God. And that's what we do. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap of praise. It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. You know, when I was up earlier, I forgot to mention when I talked about videotaping yourself and sending it in, I had the opportunity to talk to Norma Banfield this week. She and GW had just gotten back from taking a walk and they're doing fine. And she's looking forward to sending us in a video. She says, I'm going to get my daughter to get us a video because I want to be a part of this. She loves this church and she wants to come back. But, you know, she had to move away. We want to thank Reverend Andre Patterson for helping us worship today. And for those of you do, who do not know, he is the husband of Reverend Dr. Darjane Patterson, who is my administrative assistant. So we want to thank him for coming and giving up his time this morning. Come on, give God some praise. Now, as I said, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we honor those who are, uh, who are breast cancer survivors and we remember those who have lost their, who transition with this disease. You know, one of the ways that they treat breast cancer is by removing one or both breasts. That's called a mastectomy. And when it happens, it can cure the disease, but sometimes it's a side effect psychologically on the patient. They may have a self-identity crisis. They may have a self-image crisis. They begin to wonder, Am I still a full woman, even though I don't have my breasts? We see the same thing when we used to do hysterectomies. When I was a OBGYN, that's removing the uterus, I would tell my patients before I did a hysterectomy the facts of the situation. Your mindset going in will affect your recovery coming out. If you go into having a hysterectomy and thinking that I'm going to lose my uterus, that's going to make me less of a woman because that's my womanhood that you're removing. Your recovery will be long and hard. But if you go into it saying, oh, that pain is going to be gone. That extra bleeding is going to be gone. All those doctor visits are going to be gone. I'm not going to have any more periods. As a matter of fact, I'm not, I don't have to use birth control anymore. If you go in with that mindset, your recovery is a lot quicker and your healing process is much faster. It's about having the proper mindset. You see, and a, a psychologists today will tell us that the problem with mankind is that we have low self-esteem, that we have a poor self-image. But, you know, that's not what Paul talks about. Paul sees it differently. He says it's not that we have a poor self-image, but that we need to have a correct self-image. That's what he talks about in the text that was read earlier by Reverend Patterson. Verse three says this. I say to everyone among you not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Sober judgment means we are to use logic. We are to use everything that we have, especially the word of God, to determine who we are. We shouldn't think too high of ourselves. We shouldn't think too low of ourselves. We should have a proper self image. So today I want to talk to you just a little while on restructuring your self-image, restructuring your self-image. Won't you pray with me? Well, Lord, our God, we come just to say thank you that one more time we can come to worship and praise your name. But Lord, there are many of us who are not experiencing the abundance of your glory. So Lord, we need you in this moment. Open our ears, open our minds, Open our hearts and our souls so we might hear a word from you, Lord. Now minimize your preacher and maximize your spirit within that the words in my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts may be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And the children of God said, amen, amen, and amen. You know, this sermon came uh, started on Tuesday as we were in our book study, a book called Growing in Grace by Bob George. But then it picked up even more on Friday in a Bible study I was doing called The Marks of Mature Christian Leaders. And in this Bible study, they both talked about how having the wrong self-image can dam damage your Christian walk, that you won't be able to do what you need to do. But you see, too often Christians follow the main world. 
uh, we follow psychology and we follow psychology that says we need a, a better self image. We need a higher self image. Listen to some of these Christian books titles. Love yourself. The art of learning to love yourself. Loving yourselves. Celebrate yourself. You're someone special. Self-esteem. You're better than you think. And finally, self-esteem, the new reformation. Now, these are just some of the titles that are out there, not all of them. But you see how they're trying to follow the world, trying to follow psychology. But that's not what God calls us to do. We are to have a different path. You see, Paul warned us as in his letter to Timothy that this was going to come. You see, we live in a world that's all about ourselves. We're selfish. We're self-centered. We want it when we want it, how we want it. And right on time, exactly like we want it. But that's not God's way. Listen to these attributes that Paul tells Timothy one day are going to come. I'm reading from Second Timothy, the third chapter. He says, you must understand this, that in the last days, distressing times will come where people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, arrogant abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderous, profligates, brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Sound like anything we have going on in our world today? Even in our higher elected officials sound like that. Paul knew that this day was coming and he says that's because people are having the wrong image. They have the wrong impression of who they are. And so they think too much of themselves instead of thinking about God. Well, how are we to fix this? Well, Paul says in 12 and 12 and 3. Let me get back to that. We are to think more, not more highly of ourselves, but we are to think with sober judgment. And how are we to do this? Well, he tells us in verse two, he says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why we want to restructure your self image. You see, I think there are too many Christians out there who don't experience the abundant life. They are joyless Christians out there. How would you know them? Well, they'll have one or more of the following characteristics. They'll be angry. Mean. They always have to be right. They will talk over you. They will talk through you. And they don't smile nearly enough. You know anybody like that? It's because they have a wrong self image and we want them to have the right self image. You see, the problem is that we have a barrage of self-centered, uh, self-centered ideas, the thoughts rather than biblically centered thoughts about who we are and how we fit in the plan of God. So I want you to ask these, yourself these series of questions. I hope you got your, your pen and your paper down because I'm going to walk through these questions slowly because you need to understand these questions we need to ask ourselves. The first one is, what am I worth as a person? What am I worth as a person? The second is this, do I feel good about who I am or do I want to be somebody else? Do I feel good about who I am or do I want to be somebody else? Here's a third question. It's kind of long. I'm going to go through it, but I'm going to break it down in three parts after that. It says, have I accepted who I am as a person, not my sin or sinful habits, but the uniqueness God has created in me as a person? Have I accepted who I am as a person? Have I accepted who I am as a person, not my sin or sinful habits? Not my sin or sinful habits, but the uniqueness God has created in me as a person. 
but the uniqueness God has created in me as a person. You see, too often we look at our sins and our shortcomings and we measure ourselves by that rather than who God says we are. Well, I'm an addict. Well, uh, I'm an alcoholic. Well, uh, I, I, I'm a thief. Well, uh, I'm no good at this. I'm no good at that. I'm a stutterer. We look at our shortcomings and we base our opinion on that, but that's not who God says we are. You see, in order to have a, uh, a, a, a biblical concept of our self-image, we need to know three things. We need to know who, we need to know why, and we need to know where. We need to know who, we need to know why, we need to know where. We need to know who, who we are in Christ. That's what we need to know. Who we are in Christ. Then we need to know why. Why are we here? Why are we here? And then we need to know where. Where are we going? Where are we going? Now, that's too much for one sermon. So today we're just going to stick with the who. Because that's going to be enough. The who. Who are we in Christ? Well, I'm going to start off by talking about 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, where it says once you are a believer, then you are a new creation. That's right. A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Then Paul writes in uh, Colossians 3 and 10 that once you become a Christian, you need to put on the new self-image, the new self or the new man. But then in Galatians and Romans, he says we need to put on Christ. That means we need to put on Christ like behaviors. We need to have the mindset of Christ. We need to have the patience of Christ. We need to have the love of Christ. Because we are new creations. We're talking about restructuring your self-image. So there are three things I'm going to lift up. And with each one, I'm going to list up two scriptures. So I hope you have your pen and paper because I want you to hold me accountable. The first thing you need to know is that you are made in God's image. You are made in God's image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says it this way. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Then let's go to David, the psalmist. Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. He says, for it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That's uh, Psalms 139, verses 13 and 14. You see, God made you and God does not make junk. God made you special. God loves you. It says, I see how you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am wonderfully created. That's what wonderfully and fearfully made. That's you. And you were made in the image of God. And if you are in the image of God, then you are somebody. That's what you need to know. The second thing that you need to know to restructure your self-image is that you are a child of God. You are a child of God. Listen to what John writes in John 1 and 12. He says, but to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. We can add to that. Romans 8. Verses 16 and 17. I'm sorry, with verse 14. It says, for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. Then go on to verse 17. It says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You're God's child. And if we humans love our children, how much more does God love us? Jesus tells a parable that says, if your son asks you, for a, a sna or asks you for an egg, would you give him a rock? If you ask for a fish, would you give him a snake? And says, if you who are evil would do this for your own children, how much more will God do for you? You see, when we know that we are children of God and that we are also made in God's image, then we have the proper self-image. We're talking about restructuring your self-image. And the third one that I would like you to know is that you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John, the 14th chapter. 
beginning at verse 16. It says, and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. That's right. The Holy Spirit is in you and he's there to empower you to do the work that God calls you to do. Paul put it this way in his letter to the Philippians, Philippians 4 and 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He didn't say I can do all things because I know Jesus. He didn't say I can do all things because I worship Jesus. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's the power of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus that lives inside you that allows us to do what we do. Zechariah said it this way. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We're talking about restructuring your self-image. Now, if we're going to do this, we got to look at Jesus. Because Jesus knew his who. He knew his why and he knew his where. You see, Jesus did not look to man to give him his self image. He was rejected by men. And these three things formed his mental foundation for faith and his ability to love and serve others. He never sought identity from men or from the world. Think about it this way. Jesus left glory with all power in his hands and became a helpless in the being, human being. A little bitty baby who had to have his diapers changed. He didn't stop there. He had to abandon that glory. Now think if Jesus, who was part of the Holy Trinity and had all the power that they had, think if Jesus had looked at God and the Holy Spirit and say, how come I'm the one that got to go down? Why me? Why well, don't y'all do this instead of me? Because I don't want to be crucified. I don't want to give up my power. But Jesus didn't argue. He knew what his role was. That was his why. And he knew who he was in God. So he gave it all up to come down to serve us so that we have a way back with God. He did it. He became the scum of the earth so you and I won't be scum any longer. If Christ had compared himself with other men, remember, he was fully human. If he compared himself with men, he would think that I should be greater than these people. Y'all don't know where I come from. I, I can perform miracles. I, 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 I can make the blind see. I, I can make the lame walk. I can make the deaf hear. I can make the mute speak. I can cast away skin diseases. I can even raise the dead. So I should have people all over following me because I'm somebody. But what did Jesus do his last night? When there was nobody to wash the feet, he took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself, and he got down and washed the disciples' feet. He took on the form of the lowest servant, the lowest slave. That was their job. But Jesus did it because he loves us so much that he didn't care about what people thought about him because he was doing God's work. So how could one who was so high stoop so low? Because he did not compare himself to man and he also didn't compare himself to God. He only cared about doing God's will. Throughout the book of John, he completely continues to say, I only do what I see my father doing. I only do what my father tells me to do. He was on a mission to fulfill what God had called him to do. And you see, by the world standards, Jesus might even be considered a failure. When he left here, he only had about 120 followers because the others had left. Yeah, he had crowds of 5,000 and crowds of 4,000. But in the upper room, there were only 120. They were waiting when the Holy Spirit fell on him. Three years in ministry, and only 120 people and only 11 true disciples. And not only that. He was tried as a criminal and found guilty as a criminal. He was crucified as a criminal. Took my sins and your sins and placed them on himself. He died naked, hanging up there because they were casting dice for his robe, his last possession. He didn't have a home. As a matter of fact, he says foxes have their den, birds of the air have their nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. 
He didn't have possessions. He didn't have anything but himself. They would have thought he was a failure, but he was doing what God called him to do. He knew his who, he knew his why, and he knew his where. You need to know your who. You are a child of God. You are made in God's image. That's your who. And you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, to be an effective and mature servant, we too must know who we are. We must have an identity derived from God and his standards. We must know why we are here. We must know who we are and we must have a sense of God's destiny for our purpose, for our lives. So that's the, the who. We'll get to the why next week. But we don't have to worry about the where because we know where we're going. That's the first thing you learn when you become a Christian. You know where we're going. When we leave this place, we have a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. When we leave this place, we're going to a land where there is no more death, where there is no more dying. When we leave this place, we're going to be with Jesus because it says to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. We all know our where. Now you know your who. Next week, we're going to talk about your why. Restructuring your self-image so that we can be fully present in all that God calls us to do to have that abundant living. Won't you pray with me? Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you for this opportunity to learn from you that we can be the creatures that you created us to be. Lord, we are all new creations once we believe in you. Help us to walk in the newness of life Help us to find out who we are through your word that you may be glorified in us and through us. Now, Lord, restructure us and make us whole. May you get the glory. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let us all say amen. Once again, we want to give you an opportunity to sow a seed in this ministry to help us to do the work that God is calling us to do. You know, we're still giving away food every Thursday. Uh, we're going to have about 250 boxes this week. We also are still doing COVID testing every Friday. We are the only uh, continuous testing spot in the city of East Point every Friday from 10 to 4 o'clock. And that will continue throughout the rest of the year. So you can sow a seed. All you have to do is go to our website, uh, epfmumc.org. That's epfmumc.org. You can give there. You can also give on the Give Plus app. You can text the amount that you want to give to 404-567-5052. That's 404-567-5052. You can mail a check or a money order to the church at 2651, that's 2651, Church Street, East Point, Georgia, 30344. Or you can drive by the church and put it into the mail slot. We hope that you have a wonderfully blessed day. We hope that this message has touched, touched your heart and it starts you thinking about what you need to do differently. Have a wonderfully blessed day and know that God loves you.